today. He's a graduate of Hofstra University and Furman University, and during his professional years was involved in uh, uh, teaching and education and school administration. <laughs> now he's back here home in Georgetown, and we celebrate that. Steve is a motivational speaker, a writer, an activist, and for me, a good friend. Will you join me in welcoming Steve Williams? Thank you, Bob, and right back at you. <laughs> Bob is a good friend, and this organization, I want to thank the Friends of the Georgetown County Library. That includes Dwight, the director, and Heather, and uh, Mabel, and Patty. I cannot begin to begin to tell you how good they have been to me, and not just this year, but for the last 10 years when I was putting my book together. And so I'm happy to be here. I am so, so happy that you are here to help me honor some people where honor is due. But again, I want to start with thanking Dwight and Heather and all of the staff here at the Georgetown County Library because this just didn't happen. They asked me, which means they want to reach out to every tenant and every section of our community. And um, so when he asked me to do this a few months ago, I said, yes, I would. And at that time, I didn't know really what I was going to be talking about. Many of you have read my book, you've seen me and heard me many times. But I began to think, what can I do that is different? And this was around Thanksgiving. And um, Bob said, Steve, I need something because um, we don't want to wait till the last minute to promote it. So I said, well, let me think about it. And I gave it some thought. And this is what the Lord laid on my heart and would not let it go. I was like Jacob wrestling with it all night long. <laughs> We are always talking about the contributions of African Americans, but let's just be Judgment Day honest. 90% of the time we're talking about the men. But you need to know that there are some women who have, who have done some astronomical, some powerful things in this community to thrust this forward. And I began to think, I said, Steve, you have a five women in your video which is entitled The Content of Their Character that hasn't really been fully celebrated. I know we had a debut last May, but there are some women who I cannot say enough about. Now, the other thing that came to me is to juxtapose those women of the past with contemporary heroes. And all of them are selfless people who have been doing this at least 25 years. And I have to say that all of them are friends of mine, and I cannot say enough about them. So today, here's what we're going to do. We're going to try to do it all in about 75 minutes. The vi videos that you're going to see are roughly seven minutes long. We're going to vacillate or alternate between the heroes of the past, female heroes of the past, and the present. And um, what you'll notice is that there is a common thread, and the common thread is this. If I can help somebody as I travel along, if I can cheer them up with a word or a song, if I can show them that they're traveling wrong, then what? Ah, oh, if I can do my duty as a good man ought, if I can bring back beauty to a world that is upright, if I can show some love like the master taught, then what? Let me tell you something. Most of us don't even begin to think about our lives until we're at the last quarter of the game. And we have to understand that life is more than just making a living. But as one writer said, living your making. And in living your making, you can make a good living. You can be compensated. The reason that we're here is to help somebody else. And as Dr. King said, that you don't have to have a PhD. Your verbs and nouns don't have to agree. You just have to have a heart full of love to help somebody else. And so you're going to... You're going to see some people here who are very educated, very quite credentialed. But you're going to see some people that say, I don't need that to help somebody else, to help their neighbor. Mm -hmm. All right? So the theme of it is, if I can help somebody. And that's all. And people in my church, Bethel, have been hearing me say that since God was a baby. But it's okay. <laughs> because that's what Lord, the Lord has laid on my heart. Each and every one of these honorees have helped somebody in this community, and I'm just not talking about the black community. They've helped push Georgetown forward. The first person we're going to see is Florence Williams, 
who started one of the first, actually the third hospital in Georgetown, and it existed for quite a while. Then we're going to juxtapose her with another medical hero, Florine Lennon. Then we're going to go into Lillian Golden Pyatt and juxtapose her with another business hero, Barbara Hugh. Then we're going to talk about Michelle Obama. You say, Steve, what about, she's not from Georgia, no, but her grandfather and great-grandfather was. And I consider that dignity and respect, and we're going to just oppose her with um, Josephine Howard, who could not make it today. She's in Delaware with her daughter, but she's so happy you'll see on the video. Fourthly, we're going to talk about uh, Minnie Kennedy. Enough said, most of us know Minnie Kennedy. And we're going to just oppose her with another legend, that's Barbara. I'm sorry, um, Charles Ann a master educator, come from a family of educators. And lastly, we're going to talk about Matilda Martin, whom most of us call Mama Till. And we're going to just oppose her with um, Reverend Gloria Barford. And unfortunately, she's not able to attend because she's working. And I told her, I said, Gloria, and she's apologized profusely. I said, no, don't apologize. You have to work. That comes first. All right, so I want you to enjoy it. Remember, each video is about seven minutes long, and then we'll uh, give some praise and some love to the contemporary heroes of Georgetown. Thank you. Um, Truman, are we ready? Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm Willie J. Washington, uh, uh, Jr. The Florence William Hospital was located on Duke Street between King and Wood, right next to the old Harvard School. And this was uh, in the, from the 20s to the mid 50s when this hospital w was in operation or existed. If, the, if you had to uh, be, you convalescent in here, but if you, for, for some reason, it's, the sickness got to the point where you had to be relocated, you was relocated to. Uh, as I recall, at the, to Florence, South Carolina. And, and the strange thing about it is uh, us minorities, if you had to be relocated, there was no ambulance service for us. So you had to be relocated in one of the hearses that belonged to one of the funeral service, or, uh, either uh, the Manigo Funeral Service or the Wise Funeral Service. You were all welcome over to the hospital and there uh, she would assist you, and, and also some of the local doctors at the time, who was Dr. Teal and, uh, and, and later Dr., uh, Dr. Beck, they came in and they assist people, you know, if you had to be in the hospital for a while to uh, recover from whatever, th those doctors would come to the hospital and give that assistance. Well, I think uh, Ms. Florence was certainly an, an ambassador for, uh, for goodwill in regard to the people in this community. And without her, uh, a lot of people would have suffered much more hardship than, uh, you know, than they really uh, did at that time. I am Dorothy Mims Smalls Taylor. My date of birth is January 2nd, 1919. I am 98 years old. I live in the same area where I was born. Miss Florence Williams and my mother were very good friends. Miss Florence lived just about a block from us. Miss Florence had two children, but Miss Florence was a very kind person. Professor Beck was the principal of Howard School, and when kids got severe scratches and bruises, Miss Florence was always so kind and helpful to put a band-aid on them, put something on it. As a matter of fact, Miss Florence was a very good nurse because my sister, who um, also became a nurse, as a matter of fact, uh, she went to Meharry, and I have a picture of there of her there. But. Um, Miss Florence Williams worked closely with Dr. F. A. Bell, who was a, we did not have a black physician then, uh, but Dr. Bell was very, a very kind Caucasian doctor. And Dr. Bell 
opera, my sister had a, um, an appendectomy in Miss Florence Williams Hospital. And that, when I think about it, I, that's scary. Dr. Be Dr. Bell did the surgery as a fan out of the goal. But Miss Florence Williams was always such a kind woman. It doesn't matter how many times Professor Bett asked her to put something on this cut. I don't know how the kids got those cuts now because <laughs> we didn't have anything to play on, but just what was out there. But she was a very kind woman and very, very much loved. We, we didn't have a hospital here. So that was the hospital, Miss Florence Williams, a lovely and renowned person. And now let's take a closer look at her life. In 1924, Florence Williams had the dream. She was a young nurse working in a local hospital when God visited her in the form of a dream. In the dream, Florence was walking down Church Street, carrying a large bundle of sheets to a nearby house on King Street. When she arrived, there was a white man sitting behind a desk. The man said to her, it is not in this department, it's in the colored. In her dream, the colored department was on the other side of a large petition where three cots sat. On one of those cots lay a man a man Florence called the Shadow Man. As she entered the colored department, the Shadow Man said to her, there is a great work for you to do, but you cannot do it unless I help you. You must always put me as the head and I will help you do it. After speaking these words three times, the Shadow Man seemed to fade away, according to Florence. After this dream, Florence went home to ponder all these things in her heart before concluding that God had a great work for her to do. But she never mentioned her dream to anyone. Not long afterwards, the hospital she worked in closed. Yet the influence of the dream stayed on her mind. She realized there must be other work that she could do, meaningful work. At the time, she had a spare room in her large rambling house and she decided that somehow, in some way, she would dedicate her life to helping others. Not mentioning her dream or her plans to anyone, she vowed to use her spare room to help the sick and afflicted. Unexpectedly, she bumped into a friend one day on the street, Dr. F.A. Bell. Dr. Bell informed Florence that he knew of a colored boy who was ailing with lockjaw. Knowing she was an excellent nurse, he suggested that if she cared for the boy, he would get well. With his suggestion, Florence agreed to take the boy into her home and care for him. He soon recovered. Now she knew her dream was real. God had revealed to her what was in store for her life. This was the beginning of what was to become the Florence Williams Hospital. Over the next few years, the Florence Williams Hospital, which was located in her large home on Duke Street, between Orange and King Streets steadily grew into a full-fledged medical facility with two wards, 25 beds, an operation room, and a maternity ward. The hospital treated hundreds of Georgetonians. Although many of the patients she served were poor people who could not afford to pay, Florence never turned anyone away. Both black and white doctors made calls to her hospital, often performing their surgery free of charge. As America went through the difficult days of the Great Depression, families suffered tremendously, especially the black community. At a time when few roads were paved, few bridges existed, and the nearest hospitals were 70 miles away in Charleston or Florence, South Carolina. The Florence Williams Hospital was God sent. From 1926 to 1954, God kept the hospital afloat because Florence kept him first in her life. Nevertheless, her bills piled up and in a moment of frustration, Florence pleaded with God, Lord, help me. 
I'm doing what you led me to do, but I'm drowning in debt. God lovingly answered her pleas with fruit baskets, canned goods, and groceries from nearby churches like Duncan Memorial and Bethel AME. He answered with deferred payments from patients who could afford to pay. And last but not least, he answered her prayers with generous financial donations for millionaires like Bernard Baruch of Hopcaw Barony and Ann Huntington of Brook Green Gardens. Likewise, Florence of herself administering first aid free of charge to students at nearby Howard High School, treating wounded CCC, Civilian Conservation Corps workers, and taking time out of her busy schedule to teach nursing skills to aspiring young nurses, many of whom went on to receive their nursing license or medical degree from noted schools like Meharry Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee, and the Good Samaritan Medical College in Columbia. For nearly 30 years, her hospital, only the third hospital in the history of Georgetown, was a ram in the bush for thousands of needy people. Without Facebook, Twitter, GoFundMe.com, or any assistance from the government, the Florence Williams Hospital served poor people when no one else would, proving if we put God first in our lives, He will always provide the provisions for His vision. Okay, if you didn't know now, you know. Florence Williams, no relation to me, at least I don't think so. But uh, some of us within the next 12 months are going to try to put up a marker to, to um, celebrate what she did right here on Duke Street. Now, that was then and this is now. We have a local hero, contemporary hero, who has been on in the vineyards doing charitable work, doing community work, and doing it well for at least 25 years. Before I introduce her, let me just tell you that one of the phone calls that I got this morning was a very dear friend of mine that used to be a secretary at um, uh, Maryville Elementary School and she's been under the weather and I finally got the call that she passed away. And she passed away at a very, very early age. I believe she was in her 50s. I knew her as Miss Jenkins. Many of you know her at other, with other names, but she had succumbed to complications with diabetes. Why am I saying this? Because diabetes is rampant in our community. But I want to introduce to you someone who made up her mind that she wanted to do something about it. Her name is Florine Lennon, and she was born in Oakland, South Carolina. She's the fourth child of Pauline and Silas Jackson. She attended Chapley High School and is married to Herbert Lee Lennon. Growing up, she worked in the cotton and tobacco fields before focusing on a mission to help the community. And I have a loud voice. In 1982, she first learned that she had diabetes. Not only this, she learned how diabetes was disproportionately affecting her community and her state. Diabetes affects 25 million Americans and contributes to 230,000 deaths per year. Now, in our state, diabetes uh, death, basically 338,000 3, adults are diagnosed with diabetes. African Americans are twice as likely to have one of their lower limbs amputated because of uh, diabetes and we are twice as likely to get diabetes, okay? So, in Georgetown, after taking a life-changing course on diabetes, in a local workshop at least 20 years ago, Florine went to work on doing something about it. She has been on a one-woman campaign to educate her community on the causes, treatments, and preventions of diabetes. For more than two decades, she's played a significant role in the health education and health fairs, workshops, seminars, banquets, church 
schools, media outlets, and other community events. She started an organization entitled CORE, which stands for the Community Outreach Resource Education in Georgetown to help people in the rural areas, okay? Our people, said Florine, were suffering from a lack of knowledge. I learned, said Florine, that you can take control and empower yourself with knowledge. Her message is profound, but it's simple. Here's her message, get off the couch. Throw away your junk food, lose weight, and exercise. It's simple. It really is. And, 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 and we're making light of it. I just told you. I have a friend. I don't think she was 57. So it's, it's, it's simple, but it's serious. For her years of commitment, she's won several awards, including an award from the uh, former first lady uh, um, of the state of South Carolina, Mary Wood Beasley, the Palmetto Award, and just recently... She has won an award, the Community Health Champion of the Year, given out by DHEC at the 16th Annual Chronic Disease Prevention Symposium in Myrtle Beach, and that was with, within the last three, four months, all right? She is also the director, founder of the Georgetown County Diabetes Core Group, and she's been the subject of many articles in many national magazines, including Diabetic Living. Florine is also the author of a new book entitled Cotton Fields and the Capital, My Destiny with Diabetes, which tells of how she became involved in educating her community. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to give a big hand to Florine. <laughs> Alright? I have a plaque which says, If I Can Help Somebody Award, presented to Florine Lennon for her service to her community. And I have a letter from the mayor. He was unable to attend. Today is his birthday. All right. From Brendan Barber to Miss Lennon. As mayor of the city of Georgetown and on behalf of the city council, I want to extend congratulations to you for being honored for your years of hard work, commitment, and service in the health profession to the citizens of Georgetown community. Your knowledge and concern for others have been an inspiration many in Georgetown, and we are appreciative for all of your contributions. That's from the uh, My good friend, Mr. Clarence uh, Green, uh, put this together. Uh, it's, it's for the honorees, and we're going to give you at least two for your family, but it tells their biography, and it tells of what you just saw, so that's also yours. And last but not least, some beautiful flowers. Oh, wait, there's more. Afterwards, and, and, and um, Bob told me, don't tell everybody, Steve. But a few of us are going to be taking the honorees out to Arnie's for lunch because they deserve it. Don't they deserve it? Yeah. You don't have to. Oh. <laughs> it's up to you. Okay, all right. We're going to go to our next hero. Um, Truman. Be before, before we get started, um, the gentleman who is the grandson of Lillian Golden Pyatt, I just saw him. This, could you raise your hand, please? The, this video that you're going to see, this is his grand, grandmother, grandmother, okay? And you'll see what, what some of the wonderful things. Today he brought me a picture. I've been waiting for <laughs> nine years, eight years to see a picture of her, which I've never seen, but he brought me one today. Let's go. I am Dorothy Mims Smalls Taylor. I live at 409 Orange Street. My date of birth is January 2nd, 1919. I am 98 years old. I usually claim one age up until June, but after June, I don't say that. I always say, I'll be 99 my next birthday. Mm -hmm. So I am blessed and highly favored to still be around here. Well, we would go over to the beach. You know, black, blacks didn't go to the white beach because they thought maybe some of the brown would wash off and turn and make them a little brown. But uh, we would go over there and uh, 
we would wade in the water. We would um, just wade in. We couldn't swim. We'd get them down there and just splash and splash. We had no way to wash the sand off. You would just brush it off. But we had fun in that water. I remember my father, he had some relatives came back home from the north. And I remember we got um, Mr. Lewis Smalls, who had the taxi service, to take them all over there to the beach. And we all, I remember, walking in the water and splashing. And the ladies, they didn't wear pants now. They had pants like this it was an abomination. So, so they would pull these dresses up and take off those shoes and walk in that cool, nice, refreshing water. And that was good, and that was glory to us because we didn't know anything about the integration. So if they come back now and see what's happening now and what's not happening now, they would be alarmed. But those were glory days. I enjoyed it. And now, let's take a look at the story of McKenzie Beach. Lillian Golden Pyatt was a savvy businesswoman with a vision. In the 1930s, while most Americans were digging their way out of the Great Depression, Lillian had a dream that would lift her family out of the dark depths of poverty and indignity, at least in her mind. Born in 1893, Lillian left Georgetown to work in New York City for the daughter of a former Jewish rice planter from South Carolina when she was just 16 years old. Although she worked as a domestic, she learned the value of a dollar at an early age and saved just about every dollar she earned. Like many blacks who left the South seeking a better life in the North, Lillian never forgot her roots. A first-generation descendant of slaves and slave owners, she stayed connected to her family in Pauley's Island while living in New York, visiting them whenever she could. In 1934, Lillian saved her family's property from the county's auctioneer. The property was due to be sold for unpaid taxes. Consequently, Lillian found herself the executor of 17 acres of oceanfront heirs property on South Carolina's Grand Strand. But in 1934, the Grand Strand was not so grand yet. The condominiums, pavilions, golf courses, high-rise hotels, subdivisions, and sprawling resorts, which now pepper the shoreline of Waccamaw Neck, were not yet built. Nevertheless, things were happening and Lillian knew it. Georgetown and Horry County officials were making full use of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal programs, which paved the roads, built the bridges, and developed the infrastructure to support the region's growth. With World War I over, Prohibition repealed, and the Great Depression ending, Americans were celebrating again. Nationally known artists such as Count Basie, Charlie Parker, Billie Holiday, Ray Charles, Duke Ellington and Lena Horne were performing in nearby clubs. Lillian had a vision. She dreamed of turning her beachfront property into a successful resort for musicians and motorists traveling along the East Coast. When Georgetown's Lafayette Bridge, the last link of highway for motorists traveling from New York to Miami, was finally completed in 1935, Lillian knew it was time to activate her dream. Knowing that black motorists Traveling along Highway 17 were denied access to area motels because of the color of their skin. She planned to meet their needs. Her resort would not only offer lodging, but a restaurant, a bathhouse, a pavilion, and a club for socializing and dancing. It would be the only coastal resort between New York and Miami that catered to blacks. But before her dreams could come true, Lillian would have to overcome a few obstacles, the first of which would be location. Her property did not extend all the way to the newly paved Highway 17. Travelers wanting to reach her place would have to come off the main highway and walk across a yet-to-be-destructed causeway. Lillian needed access to the property adjacent to hers, but she did not know who owned it or if they would be willing to give travelers access to her planned resort. Her second challenge would be money. Despite having saved some money, she did not have enough for such a large undertaking. She quickly realized the need for investors and found two local investors in Georgetown, Dr. Ulysses Teal and Frank McKenzie. Frank McKenzie's wife, Elizabeth, along with her two sisters, had inherited land on the mainland side of Lillian's beachfront property. Soon he and his wife would buy out the remaining heirs to the property. After Lillian pitched to Frank her dream of combining their properties to build a resort where blacks could visit the beach, enjoy great food, strong drinks, and live music, without fear of racial discrimination, he and Lillian struck a deal. 
Frank would live locally to oversee its construction and manage the resort, while Lillian would continue to raise capital for their joint venture. Lillian's dream was finally taking shape. In 1936, with Lillian bankrolling the transaction, construction began on a causeway that would run across the Midway Creek and connect the mainland to the south end of Litchfield Beach. Over the next few years, they would successfully build a causeway, a club, a motel, a pavilion, and 15 cabins. Meanwhile, Lillian continued working in New York to raise capital for their resort, promoting the resort to everyone she met. She would name it the Magnolia Beach Club. Word spread quickly throughout the low country that big name bands like Count Basie and Charlie Parker were stopping over to play at the Magnolia Beach Club. Lillian, the consummate salesperson, enticed these musicians to stay at her club for free in exchange for playing music. At first, the crowds were black, but as fame of the entertainers and dance style spread, white and black young people mingled in droves at the club. During the 1930s, cars and buses routinely stopped along Highway 17 as people gladly paid to cross the bridge and get to the resort. World War II slowed things down somewhat, but the good times picked up again after the war. With food prepared by well-liked cooks, drinks served by Frank McKenzie, and performances by big-name artists, Magnolia Beach Club was suddenly the place to be in Georgetown County. Tragedy struck in 1954 when Hurricane Hazel demolished the property, swept away cabins, and killed more than 20 people. The storm all but destroyed the resort, rearranging the oceanfront, including the footbridge, to get to the club. After the devastating storm, federal regulations prohibited the bridge from being rebuilt. With so much destruction and high costs of repair, Lillian and Frank decided to dissolve their partnership. In later years, with the help of family and friends, Frank rebuilt his part of their property, turning the resort into a more family-friendly atmosphere. The resort, which was now known as Mackenzie Beach, despite having no access to the beach, included a 12-unit motel, bait and tackle shop, and a small tavern on the property between the highway and the creek. In a segregated area, caravans and buses carrying black tourists from South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia passing through Georgetown on the way to Magnolia Kinsey Beach were a frequent sight. Today, all that remains of the once popular resort are the remnants motorists see as they drive north along Highway 17 in Litchfield and Pauley's Island. Yet there are many who remember the good times had at the Magnolia McKenzie Resort in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. The simple pleasures of life afforded by Frank McKenzie and Lillian Pyatt. I like the way he said it, the simple pleasures of life. Mm -hmm. We take all of this for granted now. But long before air conditioning and in the hot, and y'all knows it gets hot. <laughs> we couldn't even go to beach. Why well, we'd have to go all the way up to Atlantic Beach. But Lillian Golden Pyatt, along with Frank McKenzie, mm -hmm. had an idea. And she worked with that idea until it came to reality. She was a businesswoman. She understood the value of property and saving money. And I, I don't mind telling you, all of that property on so-called Grand Strand now is worth millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. But it comes from the descendants of slaves and slave owners. Mm -hmm. And during the Depression, many of us lost that, but not her. Mm -hmm. All right. A contemporary hero, businesswoman, and personal friend. And I can't begin to begin to tell you how proud I am to call her friend. Because when I was putting my book together, she perhaps more than any one individual, and I had a lot of people, she helped me the most. I'm going to give you a little background on it, but there's so much to her biography, I can't give you all of it. But I'll give you some of it. Can you all hear me back there? Yes. Okay. Barbara Hill is proud to say that she is a product of her family, Bethel A and B Church, and her teachers on every level. She's a graduate of Howard High School. She earned her BA degree in African American history and French with a minor in German from Spelman College. Her graduate degree was in early childhood education from the University of Georgia. While a student <coughs> at Spelman via Crossroads, Af Af via Crossroads, Africa, she was selected to help build a youth center in Senegal, West Africa, and lived there for three months. For seven years, she divided her time between work at a Black Child Development Institute in Washington, D.C., 
and the Martin Luther King Jr. Community School in Atlanta, which he founded in 1969 and directed, all right? As a fellow of the Southern Education Foundation, she worked with educators and community workers in establishing much needed child uh, development centers in five southern states, which were South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, Mississippi, and Alabama. All right, after she returned to Georgetown to live, she continued this work in a capacity of a consultant and a teacher trainer. Her father, illness, required her to return to Georgetown. So, in 1975, her family moved to fulfill the duty of her father and forefathers. Since then, she helped establish and for 18 years assisted in operating CAHO, which many of you know is an acronym for the Committee for African American History Observances, and was an, organi an organization which brought Georgetown premier artists and history, historic programs featuring luminaries such as, as friends, the National Senegal of West Africa, Gwendolyn Brooks, poet laureate of Chicago, uh, Lerone Bennett, actor Ozzie Davis, and Ruby D, Sweet Honey, and The Rock, and the Alvin Ailey dancers, okay? She taught remedial uh, reading in Plantersville Elementary until selected to the beach, which is broad educational and creative happening, the school district gifted and talented program. Later, she continued to serve her community for years. Now, here's what she's currently doing. Some of you know this, some of you don't. Her latest endeavor is the founding of the Mitney Project, along with her husband, which addresses a number of social and cultural needs of children and their families in Georgetown, offering classes and activities on how, get this now, how to improve, uh, and, uh, how to improve business, how to improve manage money, to start your own business, to buy your own home, adult computer classes, art classes, physical fitness classes, health cooking classes, dance workshops, robotics for kids, and many, many more. This is what's going on at the Mitney Center, all right? Our creed is this, a hundred years or more from now, it won't matter what kind of house that I live in, she's got many, all right? What kind of car that I drive in, or how many other material things I may, I may have Acquired. What will matter is the influence that I have left on a child. So when I say, if you can help somebody, has she been helping her community? Yeah. All right, give her a hand. <laughs> yes, Anna, because everyone doesn't know Barbara. <laughs> this is Barbara Hugh, y'all, my friend. read this because we're on YouTube and um, there are two honorees who were not able to come because I want everybody to be recognized fairly. Amen. Here's what the mayor said. As mayor of the city of Georgetown and on behalf of the city council, I want to extend congratulations to you for being honored for your years of leadership, direction, and commitment as a professional businesswoman to the city citizens of Georgetown community. Your wisdom, and she's very wise, and compassion have been an inspiration to many. And Georgetown is appreciative of all your contribution, Mayor Brendan Barber. Yeah. And some flowers from Steve Williams. <laughs> Going to uh, Truman. We're going to move to the next one. Where is he? 
the odds were not good. The prognosis was poor and the chances were slim that the great-great-granddaughter of a lowly slave and the granddaughter of a second-class citizen would grow up to become the First Lady of the United States of America. The improbable journey of Michelle Obama from slavery to segregation from the Civil Rights Movement to the White House traveled through many generations, many hardships, and many sacrifices. Sacrifices of those who came before her and paid the price. People like Marian Anderson, Shirley Chisholm, Fannie Lou Hamer, Ella Baker, Rosa Parks, Lorraine Hansberry, Ruby Bridges, Amelia Boynton Robinson. Angela Davis, and last but not least, the Birmingham bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church. In African tradition, respect for your elders, your ancestors, and the earth is paramount. Though they were forced to come to America and stripped of nearly all of their traditions and culture, slaves maintained a healthy respect for their elders and ancestors. Long before Westerners propagated Earth Day or Go Green, Africans understood the importance of respecting Mother Earth. Unfortunately, their slave masters would not allow them to replenish what they excavated from the earth. Nevertheless, they never forgot the wisdom of the African proverb, if you are good to your ancestors, they will be good to you. This has never been truer than in Michelle's family history. Her great-great-grandfather, Jim Robinson, toiled in the drudgery of one of Georgetown's celebrated plantations, the Friendfield Plantation. Despite the wealth that he and other slaves created for their masters, Robinson lived in a modest 19-foot-wide slave cabin designed to house several families at once. After the Civil War, he continued to live and work on the Friendfield Plantation until his death. Among his surviving children was Fraser Robinson, who was born in 1884. As a teenager, Fraser Robinson could not read or write, but learned to read by the time Fraser Robinson Jr. was born in 1912. As Georgetown's economy began to crumble during the Great Depression, Fraser Robinson Jr. traveled north to Chicago in search of employment. While there, he met and married LaVon Johnson, to whom Fraser Robinson III, Michelle's father, was born in 1935. Michelle's grandparents later returned to Georgetown and became active members of Bethel AME Church. Michelle grew up in a small but comfortable apartment on the south side of Chicago, where she attended public schools and excelled in every grade. She received her BA in Sociology from Princeton University in 1985 before earning her law degree at Harvard in 1988. Michelle probably never met her paternal great-great-grandfather, her great-grandfather, or her great-great-grandmother, Melvinia Shields, a slave who was impregnated by a white man. Nevertheless, each of her ancestors planted their seed into her DNA. They were illiterate, to be sure, but they valued hard work and education. The racial climate of their day may have stifled their life opportunities, but not their dreams. In the theater of their minds, they imagined a better future, a future where the sky was the limit. 
They probably knew their seeds of hard work, discipline, and education would take more than a generation to sprout, but they planted them anyway and watered them with their faith. It was this faith that enabled them to overcome the hardships of being African American in the 1900s. Through it all, the fruit of their labor slowly but surely began to sprout. It sprouted with Marian Anderson, Jackie Robinson, the Brown vs. Board of Education Supreme Court's decision, Rosa Parks, Lorraine Hansberry, Jane Pittman, Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela. Thank you that you chose to care. Amelia Boykin, and Barack Obama. Because her ancestors toiled in the drudgery of Georgetown rice fields and laid the foundation for her success, Georgetown must be credited for the seeds they planted for her more than 100 years ago. Those seeds have now taken root, and America is basking in their glory. God bless you, and may God bless the United States of America. You're probably saying, Steve, yes, we like Michelle Obama, but what had she to do with Georgetown? As you can see, it was the seeds that were planted generations ago that sprouted. And Georgetown is very proud of the Obamas. And so I decided, how am I going to connect this with the contemporary heroes? Well, one of the things that I recall is the feeling and the exuberance that I had. I don't know about you, but that I had the first night that Obama was elected and he was standing in that big park in Chicago, Grant Park, on stage with his wife and his children, I could not stop the tears. Yeah. Why? Because we, stony the road we travel. We come a long way just for two things, dignity and respect. And I looked at Michelle and I looked at Barack and I'm saying, oh my God, I can't stop crying. Because you don't know my dad used to say, you, you just don't know what we've gone through. You can't know it unless you've experienced it. So I start to say, who do I know who has so much dignity and so much respect? She is a legend. And her name is Josephine Howard. Uh, she's not here. She's in Delaware with her daughter. You're going to see her in a minute. But I consider her a champion of respect and dignity. She carried herself with dignity and respect. She was learned and skilled and gifted. Let me give you a little bit of her biography. Josephine Cardwell Howard was born and raised in Orangeburg, South Carolina. She received a Bachelor of Science degree from South Carolina State College and her Master of Music Education degree in organ from Indiana University. Um, a lifelong educator, Mrs. Howard, positively impacted the lives of many young people in Georgetown. Highlighting her years as a music teacher, she was selected as the Georgetown County Teacher of the Year and the Honor Roll Teacher and the State Finalist of the Year. She has been a recipient of many awards from the African American Church and the Sons of Allen, the Hospice Award, the Delta Sigma Data, uh, Theta Award, a Mayweek Award, Outstanding Service and the Preservation of African American Heritage for the 7th Episcopal District AME Women's Missionary. Okay, uh, and then there's probably 30 more awards here. Mrs. Howard, entire life, has been involved in church music. She is a member of Bethel Church in Georgetown where she served for over 50 years and as the Ministry of Music and Organist. She was the re representative for the 7th Episcopal District of the AME Church and the International Commission on Worship. And this commission compiled the Bicentennial Hymnal and the Book of Worship, both of which are still in the AME churches today. She has conducted numerous workshops on church music throughout the South, uh, Southeast. At the request of the superintendent, school superintendent, Mrs. Howard composed 
the music and the words for the alma mater for Georgetown High School. She is a life member of the NAACP and the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority. She was married for 61 years to the late Bruce Howard Sr., another giant, and is the mother of Lynn Howard of Wilmington, Delaware, that's where she is today, and the late uh, her son Bruce uh, uh, Howard Jr. She has four grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Since she's going to see this on YouTube, let's give her a big hand. Please. called her and tell, told her I wanted to honor her. I asked her to do a quick um, thank you and we're going to play it now. This is Joe Howard. I'm sorry that I can't be with you today for this wonderful event. Thank you so much to Steve Williams and the friends of the Georgetown Library and thank you to Mayor Barber for your recognition. Congratulations to the, all the stalwart women who are being recognized. Enjoy your day, and I'll see you soon. I'll see you soon. <laughs> but it sounds important. <laughs> okay, um, I'm listening to a radio program about a week ago, and actually it came on last night. It was a program, if you saw it on PBS, it's called Tell Them We're Still Rising. And it's about HBCUs, Historical Black Colleges and Universities. Before we get to this next giant, I want to quote someone from that video. In the antebellum South during slavery, get this, it was totally legal to beat your slaves, totally legal to rape your slaves, totally legal to sell slaves, but totally illegal to educate them. That's how important education is, and that's how important to them that blacks should not be educated. So when we talk about education, you have to understand, now I know it's difficult today, we have a lot of kids who could care less about education. But there's been a lot of people for a long time that's been trying to help our community to lift ourselves up. And so we're going to see a great educator by the name of Minnie Kennedy, and then we're going to see a contemporary legend. Let's go. My name is Margaret Dunmore Knox. I'm a born Georgetonian. My grandfather was Samson Dunmore, my father Lawrence Dunmore, a grandchild of Ernest Atkinson, William Atkinson. I uh, knew Minnie Kennedy for quite a while as a child. She was read on the root plantation and she never forgot her humble's beginning there. She always told us about her childhood experiences on the plantation, and she always told it in such a way to make you laugh. She graduated from Howard High School, valedic valedictorian of her class, attended State College, taught in Georgetown for a few years, and moved to New York. But she never forgot Georgetown, and eventually she returned to Georgetown. And Minnie was a loving person, full of wisdom and courage, never afraid to speak up for what she believed in. No matter who it was, she would let them know her feelings. And she always spoke up for the rights of blacks. And um, she came back to Georgetown and got involved in the uplifting of blacks and always encouraging the young people to get to attain the highest educational level possible. Her life is just dedicated to helping others. Now, let us take a closer look at her life. Minnie the Rebel. When Minnie Kennedy was born on December 25th, blacks were not allowed to give birth in Georgetown's 
hospitals. So Minnie says, a colored midwife delivered me. When I came out, my mother told me, I grabbed the hold of the midwife's apron and would not let go. Neither my mother nor the midwife could pry my fingers loose. Then my mother called for my father. William, come here, she said. I think I got a witch. As she grew old enough to learn the story of her birth, she laughed and told her mother, Mama, you didn't have a witch. You had a rebel. I was trying to tell you something, but you didn't know what I was saying. I was trying to tell you to put me back where I came from. It's too dangerous out here. Out here was Georgetown, South Carolina in 1916, a world where blacks were just a generation or two from slavery. A pre-voting rights, pre-civil rights, pre-integration world with virtually no rights. A Jim Crow world of black codes, race riots, and lynchings. A world where blacks were thoroughly relegated to second-class citizenship. This was the world that many Kennedy inherited in the 1920s and 30s. It was also during the Great Depression, and in the irony of ironies, many would grow up around one of the richest men in America, Bernard Baruch. In 1905, Baruch, a Wall Street mogul and presidential advisor, purchased 18,000 acres of plantations in Georgetown and renamed it Hobcaw Barony. The property came with several antebellum structures. It also came with slave cabins and slave descendants. Benevolently, Baruch allowed the descendants to stay on and work as domestics. Two of these residents were Minnie's parents, William and Daisy Kennedy. My mother was Mr. Baruch's cook, says Minnie. She cooked for Baruch, President Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, and other dignitaries. My dad was a jack of all trades who took them duck hunting and gaming. Our house was the closest house to the Baruch mansion. Growing up, Minnie did not particularly like what her parents did for a living. It was too domestic with too many bosses, not their color. I had strong negative feelings about segregation because I didn't understand it. She attended a one room grade school with the other colored children on Hobcaw Barony. Despite the hand-me-down school books she was given, many wanted to learn, so she made the most of it. After grade school, she attended Howard High School in Georgetown and graduated at the top of the class of 1935. Many overheard Bernard Baruch promise her father one day that if any of his children wanted to go to college, he would pay for it. She never forgot the promise. After graduating from Howard, many applied to South Carolina State College in Orangeburg and got accepted. In 1935, the tuition for South Carolina State was $30 a semester plus $12 for room and board. Every year, Minnie's dad worked hard to send her back to state and every year there was less money to do so. One day without telling her parents, Minnie wrote Bernard Baruch a letter reminding him of his promise. True to his original promise, Baruch wrote back to Minnie's parents with a check for $600, but he also attached a note which read, that Minnie sure is rude. Minnie's parents admonished her for bothering the busy Mr. Baruch, but Minnie responded, but a promise is a promise, and he promised. After graduating from state, Minnie returned to Georgetown and taught math at Howard High School. She worked for a short time, but in her heart, she wanted more, more money, more respect, and more opportunities. Longing to be a part of something bigger, she moved to New York City. Despite the accommodating household in which Minnie was raised in New York, she discovered people who found her interesting, especially her ideas about educating children. Before long, Minnie would be at the center of a new movement in preschool education one with new ideas and new theories that aggressively challenged the existing practices of her day. She would become widely respected for employing teaching methods to teach children of poverty, methods that effectively build self-esteem and responsibility. She would become a successful school administrator and popular consultant on early childhood education. But something was still missing. Despite commanding a comfortable salary and respect of her peers, she was still restless. 
She did not know what it was until the day she stood at the Lincoln Mall in Washington and heard Dr. Martin Luther King deliver his I Have a Dream speech. I have a dream Many says, when I heard that speech, it was the first time I really felt free. The speech challenged her forever and empowered her to become a part of something bigger. After King's admonishment to work together, pray together, struggle together, stand up for freedom together, and if necessary, go to jail together, many knew what her new mission in life was to be. She joined the Congress of Racial Equality, CORE's Freedom Riders, and traveled throughout the South calling attention to the problems of segregation. With the Southern states requiring voters to pass biased exams or answer obtuse questions like, how many bubbles are there in a bar of soap? Before they could vote, many attempted to dismantle the black codes which blocked Amer African Americans and poor whites from voting. She spent her summers helping disenfranchised voters in the Deep South and vividly recalls how one of her students, an 80-year-old black man in Louisiana, came walking down a dusty road with a walking cane. The sun was out and it was very hot. He walked right up to Minnie and said, Darling, I hear that you teach people how to read enough to pass the test. I want you to teach me to read that constitution so I can vote before I die. Realizing the sense of urgency, Minnie taught him what he needed to know about the state's constitution. He was a quick learner, says Minnie, who later learned the 80-year-old man passed the test and voted for the first time in his life. Despite gaining their hard-earned rights after the Civil War with their blood, sweat, and tears, African Americans watched as Jim Crow, Black Codes, and the KKK methodically took them away. Thanks to many Kennedy and people like her, people whose spirits were larger than their circumstances, we now have them back. Many Kennedy. <laughs> This next educator hero, likely, I first approached her since we attend the same church. Can uh, someone turn this light? Thank you. I'm dark enough. <laughs> I, I first approached her months ago in church during the peace, and I said, Miss Button, I'm going to be honoring you and other for Black History Month. She said, When is it? <laughs> I said, February, I'll come back and tell me later. i got too much going on. And she does have a lot going on. So I reminded her just about every two weeks. I love her. Charles Ann Button is a retired educator. She is the daughter of the late Peter H. and Pauline D. Hemingway. She received her Bachelor of Science and Masters of Education at South Carolina State. Her postgraduate work was completed at George Peabody College in Nashville and the University of South Carolina. As an educator, Mrs. Button influenced the lives of thousands upon her retirement from Kensington Elementary School, where she served for at least 34 years as a principal and teacher. She was elected to the Georgetown County School Board, and she is recognized as being the first African-American teacher to integrate the Georgetown County public school system, the first African-American to serve as the principal of Kensington Elementary, and the first African-American chair, African chairperson of the Georgetown County School Board, where she served for at least 16 years. She's been a member of Bethel AME for more than 70 years, she has served in various leadership capacities. She's also served as uh, community organizations, a Democratic Women's Council of Georgetown. Uh, Mrs. Button is a life member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, where she has faithfully served her community in a variety of ways. She also holds a membership in the Georgetown County Education Association and the State and National Education Association and a lifetime member of the NAACP. Now, you talk about awards, she's got more than anyone. So I'll just give you a few. 
Other wards include the District Sons of Allen, uh, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority May Week Award, Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Award, Leadership Award, School District Award, Georgetown County Boys Mentor Group Award, uh, I can't even say it, Mufi Omega Chapter of AKA, just numerous awards. But as I said in my newspaper article, she's never the one to toot her own horn. I had to beg her to give me some of these pictures. <laughs> she's modest. Then, as Jane Brown said, don't take no mess. But she's not the one to push her chest out, but she's had a lifetime of achievement and accomplishment. Charles Ann is married to Leroy S. Button Sr., and she's the daughter of the renowned and legendary educator, the late Mrs. Pauline Dunmore Lawrence. Help me say congratulations. City of Georgetown on behalf of the City Council, I want to extend congratulations to you for being honored for your years of hard work, commitment, and service as an educator to the citizens of Georgetown community. <coughs> your wisdom and appreciation have been an inspiration to many, and Georgetown is appreciative for all of your contributions. Journal souvenirs. Miss Charles and Mr. Right. People were asking me, uh, Steve, are you having a program? What are you going to be talking about? I, I hope to do less talking and more showing of the people who, long before I was born, was out there doing it. Okay, it is my pleasure to do this. Now, before we see the next video, let me quickly read. Uh, Reverend Gloria Bar Barford, she is my good friend, and she wanted to be here, but she, as some of you know, she worked at the Boone's Hall Plantation. She could not get off because I think they had to open. But many of you who live in Georgetown know of her. Gloria Barford is the seventh child born to the union of Reverend Sam Barr Sr. and Mrs. Rosabelle Witherspoon Barr of the North Santee community. She attended Mount Zion Elementary School and completed her high school at Howard High uh, in Georgetown. After graduating from Howard, she attended the Heritage School of Evangelism and Communications in Charlotte, North Carolina, where she attended Communications and Christian Theater. Later, she attended the Shure Foundation Theological Seminary, where she obtained a BA degree in theology. While at Heritage, she wrote for their local newspaper, traveled the country performing and theater and maintain a 4.0 grade point average. Later, she joined a local group called the Swamp Fox Players, where she received an award as the best actress in the comedy. She, uh, she has also worked with noted national uh, actor Louis Gossett Jr. on a CBS movie of the week. And this is where a lot of us know her from. After returning to Georgetown, she became the beloved gospel voice of radio station 1470 and WLMC AM. Also, she wrote a weekly column for the Georgetown Times for more than 20 years. A gifted, and I mean gifted, writer, poet, actress, and all-around entertainer, she has published a, a book entitled Empowerment of the Spirit, and she has produced numerous CDs and DVDs on the Gullah culture. Um, she is an award-winning, uplifting Christian plays. You can find one of her one-woman shows on YouTube entitled Higher Ground and Prime Elevation. She is married to the Reverend Herman Ford, Jr., where she assists him in the ministry at Mount Zion AME Church in the Andrews community. All right. She is also a licensed evangelist, itinerant elder, of the AME Episcopal Church in the Palmetto Annual Conference, Gloria says that her favorite thing to do is to witness for the Lord. Now, I've already told you that she works part-time at Boone Hall Plantation. She also works there telling Gullah stories of what it was like 
for African Americans in the antebellum South. Her riveting enactment of gullah culture and life in the antebellum South entertains as well as enlightens hundreds of tourists. Reverend Gloria Bob Ford loves people, especially children and elders. Anyone who has ever heard her sing, ever heard her speak, ever heard her perform, or ever heard her preach, know that she is a woman of God and who unselfishly will do anything for you because that is her mission to lift people up. And let's give her a big hand, please. She was not able to be here, but she asked my reverend, my friend, Reverend Dr. Betty Dees Clark from Bethel AME to receive her award. So Dr. Clark. Somebody Award presented on behalf of yours truly, and some flowers for her. Thank you. <laughs> so, our last vignette, you'll see Gloria at the end of this vignette, but I want to introduce to some and re reintroduce to many a lady who is probably the sweetest person that I ever met. She delivered my older brother, oldest brother, and her name is Matilda Martin. But we call them Mama Till. Okay. I am Dorothy Mims Smalls Taylor. Matilda Martin was a midwife. She delivered many babies, many of whom. I think she told me that she didn't eat, wasn't even uh, paid to do, but she just felt a call. She, lady, I don't know who her parents were, but she was a very, very light-skinned woman. I remember she was a member of our church. She was very spiritual, and sometimes I remember she would say. Let me give a little, this was her expression, a little light on the word. <laughs> and she would expound, she would take a scripture and she would talk about it. And I remember when she, well, she lived, her house was on the corner of Princeton meeting, but Mother Till was always very kind there. I have known some People who lived in the vicinity, I know one lady who had, oh, must be six or seven children. And they may have had many different fathers, but Mother Till would always see that they had something to eat. She would always help them. I know she didn't have a lot, but she was always willing to share. And there are so many people, so many children, if you were to ask them, I don't know where they are today, about some of them just call her Miss Till and some call her Mother Till, but she was always a mother and a very kind and sweet and a very religious person. She talked about the Lord. She lived a Christian life, but Mother Till will be remembered as a very loving, kind lady. Now let's take a closer look at Mother Till's life. I'd like somebody to mention that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to give his life serving others. I'd like for somebody to say that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to love somebody. 
I want you to say that day that I tried to be right on the wall question. I want you to be able to say that day that I did try to feed the hungry. I want you to be able to say that day that I did try in my life to clothe those who were naked. I want you to say on that day that I did try in my life to visit those who were in prison. I want you to say that I tried to love and serve humanity. Yes, if you want to say that I was a drum major. Say that I was a drum major for justice. Say that I was a drum major for peace. I was a drum major for righteousness. And all of the other shallow things will not matter. I want Starting in the 1960s, social ills began raising its ugly head in Georgetown. Families were splitting up. Babies were having babies. Homelessness was rising. And drugs were creeping into the community. Despite the longevity of its senior citizens, young people across the city and county were succumbing to HIV, AIDS, alcohol, drugs, and other social ills. On their way to the supermarkets, work, and even church, people were literally sidestepping and sometimes overstepping the homeless, often pretending not to see them. To be Judgment Day honest, there were churches, agencies, and organizations attempting to address these problems, but there was one person who went beyond what was expected of her. One person who literally followed the tenets of Jesus in Matthew 25, 35. One person who because of her good deeds will inherit the kingdom. Her name was Matilda Martin, but in deference to her kindness, everyone called her Mama Till. Born to Lewis and Lord Laura Douglas Davis in 1892, Matilda Davis Martin exemplified what it means to be Christ-like. She was the embodiment of a Christian as she dedicated her life to helping others. Although born in Georgetown, Matilda lost her mother when she was just two years old. She spent much of her early years in Beaufort, North Carolina, the home of her father. Her father was an upright man with strong character and self-discipline, was a sea captain who brought sailing ships from Boston and Savannah into Georgetown's harbors to load their rice cargo. While living in Beaufort, Matilda attended a missionary school and learned to make dresses. She later returned to live in Georgetown and attended Howard High School. Losing her mother was only the first of many hardships that she endured. She got married at 17 and bore a son for her husband, but one year later, their son died. Not long after this, her husband, who owned over 50 acres of Ayers property on South Allen, lost his property along with two houses, a store, and a business truck due to a bank foreclosure. This calamity affected him mentally and physically as their marriage faltered. Through it all, she kept the faith. Despite her personal hardships, Matilda had a natural desire to help others, especially the sick and needy. Taking the advice and tutelage of her friend, Dr. F. A. Bell, she became a nurse and midwife and worked with Florence Williams, the founder of one of the first hospitals in Georgetown. Even after the hospital closed in the early 1950s, Matilda continued to deliver hundreds of babies in Georgetown, both black and white. Nevertheless, as the struggles of the city's poor and homeless began to mount up, Matilda felt there was more that God required of her. She was convicted by the words in Matthew 25, 35. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. And I was naked and you clothed me. Sick and you visited me in prison and you came to me. She was inspired to help the downtrodden in ways that no one else did at that time. This sweet mother of the community, without fanfare or governmental assistance, took it upon herself to care for Georgetown sick and needy. She thought it not robbery to open her home to the convalescing elderly, destitute, or anyone who needed affection and moral support. Beginning with just four rooms in her large two-story house, 
at the corner of Prince and Meeting Streets, she added more and more rooms to care for more and more of the poor. Pretty soon her house grew into the Martin's rest home where anyone who needed shelter or help was welcome. For her unselfish devotion, Matilda Martin was one of the earliest recipients of the Herald's Dreamkeeper Award given annually to extraordinary achievers in Georgetown by the Committee for African American History Observances. Mama Till not only assisted in bringing hundreds of Georgetonians into this world, but she helped to smooth the final transmission of scores of others who otherwise would have died homeless, sick, and alone. Dr. Martin Luther King so eloquently reminded us of what it means to be great. He said, everybody can be great because anybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. You only need a heart full of grace, a soul generated by love. Mama Till had a heart full of grace and a soul generated by unconditional love. Who ever heard of 84 degree weather? Well, many folks can recall that together. They'll tell you well that they remember, but I'm talking about the middle of December. That's what we have here in Georgetown. There's so much about home that I could say, but you will just have to come our way. Once you get here, you may decide to stay. That's why the population is running away. You'll fall in love with Georgetown. Y'all come to see us now. I just want to thank the mayor of Georgetown, Brother Brendan Barber. I want to thank our, my friend and author, Brother Steve Williams. I just want to thank all of you Georgetonians. I want to thank everyone for giving me this opportunity to tell you thank you. And I thank you so very much from the bottom of my heart. All right. <laughs> Sit down, Bob. Before Bob comes, I want to say, like Gloria, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. This has been a wonderful turnout. I hope you enjoyed. Did you enjoy? Yeah. 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 One, I'm a former educator. One quiz. What's the theme of this tribute? Say it loud. All right. And uh, you see, Mama Till, like Dr. King said, you don't have to have a PhD. You just have to have a heart. Let me help somebody. And it's still, it was good then, and it's still now. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here today. I really have been blessed, and I know you have been as well, just really encouraged and challenged in terms of our responsibility today to help others. What a great opportunity and what a great town. I agree with her, this is a great place. Um, we'd just like to make a few announcements. First of all, if you're interested in some more from Steve, um, we had the, uh, as you mentioned, uh, last May, the premiere of his video, the DVD, the content of their character. Uh, a lot of what you saw today is available on that. They're for sale outside when you go out there by the coffee and the tea. Uh, $10 each. Also, if you don't push, nothing moves. Great book, and would encourage you to pick up one of those. That's also $10. And then a marvelous history, African American history of Georgetown, The Ebony Effects, 150 Unknown Facts About Blacks in Georgetown, South Carolina. And that's available also back there. That's 18.